Today's sermon is entitled, Refreshing the Hearts of Others. Our text today is Philemon 7. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we read His Word. Father, we are thankful that the Word that we have before us today was breathed out by You. It's not a word from men, uh, but it's revelation from heaven. And we pray that we would hear it as such, and that we would listen closely with ears attuned to the voice of our Heavenly Father. Lord, we pray that You will use this Word to mold us and shape us to the image of Christ our Lord. And so we ask that you will open this passage to our understanding in Jesus' name. Amen. This is God's Word. I'm going to begin reading in verse 1 and read through verse 7. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Appia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Amen. And may God write the eternal truths of his word upon your heart and mine. Well, if you just joined us, we've been in a study of the book of Philemon. It's a small book, uh, probably just a page long in most of our Bibles, and it's unique, not only because of its brevity, but because it's a very personal, heartfelt, intimate letter from the Apostle Paul to one of his congregants. There's no other book like it in the Bible except for perhaps Third John, where John does basically the same thing. But I love Philemon because it shows us Paul's loving pastoral approach to a very difficult situation. So there's much for us to learn about tact in this letter. But even more so, I love it because it provides a wonderful example of Christian discipleship and of what a disciple should look like. We'll see that in Paul, but we'll also see this morning, we'll see that in Philemon. Now, as we cover the background and context over the last few weeks, we know that Paul's a prisoner. He tells us so in verses 1, 9, 13, and 23. And throughout the letter, Paul is underscoring the fact that he is a prisoner. He he is in Rome. He's in prison there. And why is he a prisoner? Well, verse 1, he says, It is for Christ Jesus. Even his imprisonment was serving the Lord Jesus and his gospel. And not only that, but strikingly, Paul understands that his ministry still continues even though he is in prison. He's confined, but he's not deterred. Uh, It's a good reminder for us, isn't it? That regardless of our circumstances, we can serve Christ, whether we're free or going going about wherever we, we desire or if we're in prison. Whether we are sick in bed or full of life, ministry does not stop. You know, as I've sat with usually older people over my years as a pastor, more than once I've heard the the question, or usually it's a rhetorical statement, I don't know why I'm still here. If I live long enough, I may end up saying that someday. But their spouse or their their child has died or or most of their friends have died, and, and they're ready to go home to be with the Lord. But the truth is, God sustains our lives according to His purposes and in a manner that serves His kingdom and brings Him glory. Everything we have and all that we are, it's not for us, it's for Him. And so you can know that if you're still here, then then it is for God's purpose, it's for His glory, and according to His will... It's not according to your will or desires. It's not mine or anybody else's benefit that you're here. Concerning active ministry, you know, I know I've mentioned a lady before who was a member of our congregation years ago. A few of you, only a few of you would have known her. She's with the Lord now. She's been with the Lord for many years. But Doris was a person who epitomized this active ministry till you die concept. I mean, she was a paraplegic. She was up in years. But the first time I met her, she was pretty much bedridden, except for a few hours a day. But she did more ministry from her bed than most of us are able to do uh, who are completely mobile. She prayed. She continued to, to study the scriptures and discuss them with others. She wrote notes of encouragement. She made phone calls. She came and worshiped every Lord's Day so she could be with God's people. She kept up with everyone so she could pray for them and encourage them. And she shared the gospel with people she encountered in her sphere of influence, wherever God had placed her. Doris understood there is still a work to be done. The Lord clearly has kingdom service for us to do. Dear Christian, that's true for you, 
regardless of your age, regardless of your circumstances. Because here's Paul, he's an old man in prison, he tells us that. And he's sitting in this Roman prison, but he continues in ministry by writing this individual letter to Philemon. And so Philemon was a leader and a member of the church at Colossae. Uh, we're not sure how he and Paul met. Uh, if you look at verse 19, it appears that Philemon came to faith under Paul's preaching and ministry. Paul says, I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Apparently, as Paul was preaching there in the Lycus Valley, Philemon must have heard him, and over the course of that preaching, he came to saving faith. But they had also become friends. They knew each other. They loved each other. <clears throat> Paul is unrestrained in his love for Philemon. In verse 1, he calls him our beloved fellow worker. In verse 7 and 20, he calls him my brother. And he's not shy about doling out all kinds of commendation on Philemon in verses 4 through 7. He loves him. They're friends. This isn't Yet this isn't simply a letter from a friend, because Paul's going to make an appeal to Philemon in this letter that he receive Onesimus as a brother when he sees him, even as he was receiving Paul himself. Because Philemon, Onesimus, and Paul, they're all brothers in Christ. At the end of Colossians, Paul made that abundantly clear. He says, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you. He's one of you. He, he's come... Back as a Christian, we're, we aren't sure how Onesimus became a Christian. However, in God's providence, he found his way to Paul, who shared the gospel with him and led him to Christ. And Paul has now sent him back to Philemon. You can imagine the scene, can't you? Onesimus arriving with these two letters in hand. You know, he had the letter to the church at Colossae, and he also had this letter to Philemon. He stands there before Philemon, perhaps even outstretching this very letter. He says, you've got to read this. Philemon breaks the seal and he begins to read. And Paul is saying, take Onesimus back as a brother. This is way better than a Hollywood script. But what, what's going on uh, here? Uh, what will Philemon's response be? Will he believe Paul's testimony about Onesimus? Or will he argue that this is some kind of death row conversion? You know, it doesn't really mean anything. Will Onesimus be accepted back as a brother? Or will he become fearful again and run away? We don't know. It's an interesting fact, though, of history when Ignatius, I mean, the great bishop of Antioch, was being rounded up in the Roman persecutions about 50 years later. He's being led off there to Rome to be martyred. And he wrote wonderful letters on his way to Rome where he was going to be martyred. We have an account of another bishop, bishop coming to meet with him. The bishop was from Ephesus and he came and he prayed with him and ministered to him as he was on his way to his death. You know the name of that bishop? Onesimus. Now, we don't know if it's the same guy or not. I mean, there are many historians who speculate that it was. We don't know. Um, can't wait to find out when I get to heaven, though. I want to look at a passage this morning, though, particularly verse 7, with this one idea in mind. And that is, gospel grace leads to gospel love, which manifests itself in gospel community. Paul begins this letter with the usual grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a starting place. I mean, nothing else really matters if this is not the foundation. Everything else flows from the grace of God and the peace of God that accompanies it. Paul was writing to a brother in the Lord, one who know, the, knew the grace and the peace of God that's only found in vital union with Jesus Christ. So that's how he begins the letter. The book of Colossians would have been distributed and read to the churches in Colossae. And so Philemon would have heard that in the other letter as well. Because in, in Colossians 1, Paul says, And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. So, you know, basically Philemon, you were alienated from God. You were without hope. You were hostile in mind. You were doing evil deeds. But Christ has reconciled you in his body by his death so that he might present you holy and blameless before the throne of God. And it's clear Philemon knew this gospel of grace because the love flowed from his life. Paul, and Paul even heard of it. He says in verse 5, Because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. Even as far away as Rome, Paul had heard of Philemon's great love for all the saints. By the way, he was manifesting his faith and because the gospel had taken deep roots in his life. Maybe Paul heard it from Epaphras, you know, 
uh, who, the, who the church of Colossae had actually sent to Paul to deliver some, some goods to help him in his imprisonment. Maybe he heard it from Onesimus, that Philemon loves his brothers and sisters. His, he, he abounds in love. And he knows that you cannot be a purveyor of this love without having been gripped by the gospel of grace and having faith in Jesus Christ. You know, if we're apprehended by the gospel of grace, we will be marked by gospel love toward one another. Being gripped with the gospel of grace always leads to gospel love, and that gospel love manifests itself in a gospel community. Paul points that out in verse 6 there with a Greek word. We studied this last week, the word koinonia or community. It refers to this mutual participation or this mutual bond that we have with one another as believers. Paul says he thanks God for Philemon's sharing or his koinonia, which springs forth from his faith in Christ and his love for his brothers and sisters in the Lord. You know, I hope and pray as a congregation that we're striving uh, in our life to, to live out this community of faith in a true sense of community. Christ saved us to Himself and to one another. There's no such thing as Lone Ranger Christianity. I mean, there's really no such thing as even Lone Ranger and Tano Christianity. Uh, we all need one another. I need you. You need me. We belong to one another. And the gospel of grace leads to gospel love, which manifests itself in gospel community. It's no accident that Christ said, Everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another. Isn't that interesting? There are so many different things he could have said that they will know us by. You know, they'll know you by your evangelism. They'll know you by your generosity. They'll know you by your friendly attitude. That's not any of the things that he said. Because we don't look alike, we don't eat alike, we don't talk alike. The distinguishing mark of the Christian community is unrestrained, abounding, sacrificial, giving gospel love. Why is it that love is above all the distinguishing marks of our community? Well, because God is love. We of all people know love unlike anyone else on the face of the earth. In 1 John 4, 10, In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. We're the recipients of that love. It's what binds us together. It's what marks out who we are. Therefore, it manifests itself in gospel community. And you can see how Paul really is setting the stage here for what he's about to ask Philemon to do. He's going to want him to show love, grace, and generosity to this runaway slave, perhaps even a thief, who is now his brother, united to him in the gospel. And Paul is hopeful. We're going to see that as we return to this text in weeks ahead. But he's hopeful because Philemon lives in love in this community of grace. In verse 7, where Paul closes this prayer section, is, is one of my favorite verses because it paints the picture of this gospel love and community so demonstrably and it makes me examine my own life. I have a, a morbid you know, fascination, I guess, for walking around in cemeteries. I, I do. I love to walk around looking at gravestones. I remember when I was a young boy in North Carolina, I used to help my cousin mow a huge cemetery with a push mower. Uh, it would take us more than a day to cut it. So I, I spent a lot of time pushing that mower around past those tombstones, around them, reading them, even dripping sweat on some of them. But even today, I love to walk around and look at what's etched on gravestones. Sometimes it's just a person's name and date of, of their birth and their death, and that's it. But I like to read also what family members or sometimes even the deceased themselves have written to go on their, grave, their gravestone. How do you sum up a person's entire life in a few words? Well, I think if Paul was writing an ep epitaph for his friend Philemon, it would be in verse 7. He knows that the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Isn't that a wonderful description of a Christian? Basically, he loved God's people well. You know, it would be great if someone could legitimately say that about you and me. Uh, that, that's what Paul's saying about Philemon. There's no greater sign of fervent love for God than loving his people well. And Paul says, I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother. And Why? Because Paul knows that the hearts of the saints, incidentally, the, the Greek word here translated hearts, it's a very unique word because it really speaks of the entire emotional state of the person. It's like saying this feeling deep down in your gut, their entire emotional state has been refreshed by you. And some of you are like that. And I want to be more like that uh, to refresh those around me. The word refreshed is a word that implies 
that there's some, some kind of depletion has taken place. There's something lacking. If people need to be refreshed, it's because they, they lost something or something isn't there. They're tired and weary. So refreshment here has the idea of rest. It's the same word that's used in the Gospels at times to speak of the disciples need to go away and rest. Or it's even the, the term that Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28, when he said, Come to me, all you, you who are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you Rest. Rest is that word there for refreshment. There's, there's something lacking. There's a need. We all have this need. And the gospel community is supposed to provide that. Christ chooses to work through us by His grace to give refreshment and rest to one another's souls as we extend gospel love to one another. I need it, and so do you. Every single person who walks through those doors needs it. We all have fears within and trials without. You know, at the close of every presbytery meeting, uh, we always sing from our Psalter. We sing Psalm 133. The words of that psalm are, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It's like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. How good it is just to be in the midst of people who are gripped with the gospel of grace, who manifest the gospel love. It's refreshing. It restores the soul. So the church, the gospel community, we're supposed to be a little oasis in the middle of the desert of this world. It's supposed to be a place of refreshment. And here, here's Paul. He's sending Onesimus back. Philemon, receive Onesimus. He's saying that to him. Our community is different from that of the world. You will know where to find rest like you will here. You won't find rest except anywhere except in the gospel community. It's an oasis. It's a momentary way station, if you will, a rest stop along the highway of life, a place where you encounter Christ's love manifested through and in his people. It's a community changed and affected by the gospel of grace. There's refreshment here. You know, none of us are going to receive or experience perfect refreshment, of course, because this isn't heaven. And so our expectations need to be real, realistic and not too idealistic. In fact, we need to be very patient and quick to forgive, long-suffering toward one another. That in itself is refreshing, isn't it? It's different. It's not like the world. You know, you shouldn't have to think you come in here uh, and join us with your, having your life all together in order to walk through these doors and dwell within these walls or be a part of this community. In fact, we are all a mess. But the gospel community is a place where people aren't standing around being critical, or at least we're not supposed to be. We're quick to forgive and, and quick to extend grace because we have been recipients of grace. Think about Philemon here. Despite all of the con uh, commendations that Paul gave him, he's a sinner. He's a sinner in all of the areas of his life as well. I mean, he's a slaveholder. Uh, Onesimus, whom Paul is commending to Philemon, is a sinner. He stole from Philemon, and he's a sinner in all other areas of his life as well. We're going to be perfect one day when we see Jesus, but it's not going to happen until then. So what do we do then? We, we seek to refresh one another as we live out gospel love by the gospel of grace. The church has often been called a hospital for sinners, and so it is. Of course, Christ is the great physician, but you and I are called to serve Christ by helping carry one another's burdens, by helping bind one another's wounds, by dispensing the means that will restore health. We encourage life. We extend mercy. We want gospel love to be so manifested in our midst that the people who come here can say, this is a place of restoration and rest. My, how they love one another. These people are full of grace and love. So how can you do this? How can you be a refreshment? Well, there's so many ways. I mean, for example, you can write... Uh, notes of encouragement to people in the congregation. I mean, don't hesitate to encourage others. Paul did this over and over in his letters. I don't know why we're so hesitant to encourage people. I just received a, a note from a friend today in the mail. A man who, who's taught me many things and someone I love very dearly. And he wrote me a note of encouragement just to spur me on in ministry. It meant the world to me coming from him. And some of you are so good at encouraging people and you that can be a whole ministry in itself. You, you can refresh their souls. You can remind them of the promises in Scripture. You can, uh, some of you are good at writing condolence cards when someone loses a loved one. You know how to grieve with those who grieve and, and mourn with those who mourn. 
You know, I love it on Sunday mornings here when I look around the sanctuary after the service and I see people staying and they're standing around, they're talking, they're making new friends. They're getting to know each other at a deeper level. They're extending fellowship. And that's so important. Find, find a person who's sitting by themselves or a visitor and, and talk about the sermon. Speak about Christ. Talk about, as Paul says in this passage, every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. Isn't that the most refreshing of all conversations? You know, you're, you're speaking about Christ and all of His benefits. You're intentionally loving others. Paul was clearly living an intentional, I'm sorry, Philemon and Paul were living intentional lives of love. Be willing to go out of your comfort zone. You know, you've got to walk up to somebody sometimes and, and ask them. Go pursue them. Ask them about their, their work, their family, their lives. Get to know them. Get to know people and love them. To do that, you have to let your guard down. I know it can be challenging for people who are introverted. It won't look the same for those who are extroverted. But to love people, you have to interact with them. You have to have conversation with them. Uh, maybe some of you would share your faith with others. As Paul says here, live in gospel community. Exercise gospel love. There's a brown bag lunch we have uh, last Sunday of every, of every month. Um, you could go to that. Get to know people at a deeper level. Take, take a widow out for lunch or dinner. Volunteer to watch someone's children in order to give them a break. That's refreshment to the soul. We have several couples who are taking care of aging parents. Come alongside them and encourage them. Pray for them. Uh, ask if there's ways that you can serve them. But let me be clear. Regardless of how it manifests itself, recipients of gospel grace are filled with gospel love. And they show that in gospel community because we're a gift to one another. Notice in this text that even as we give, we lose nothing. In fact, we gain. In verse 6 of this prayer, Paul prays that this sharing, this generosity, this, this true fellowship and community, it will be effective in Philemon. How? For the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. So he prays that through this, this giving and this community, that Philemon might know, not just cognitively, but experientially. He might know what good things Christ has given to him. That is, as Philemon shares and engages in community and love, the benefits are actually his. Because he's led to a deeper understanding and experience of Christ and everything that he gives. It's the same principle that Paul states in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. When we sow grace, we reap grace. When we sow love, we reap love. That's going to be the basis of Paul's plea here to Philemon. You, you have been given such a rich gospel grace. You've been shown in that in your gospel love manifesting itself in gospel community. Philemon, you have yet another opportunity. It, it is a hard circumstance. It's not going to be easy, but it's an opportunity for you and not just for Onesimus. So friends, that's what we have today and in the weeks ahead, months ahead. We have an opportunity to live in gospel community and, and exhibit gospel love. Uh, we are all the beneficiaries of that. Our Lord and our God, we're thankful that you're a God of grace. We're thankful that you've poured out that grace upon your children. We're grateful that not only have you reconciled us to, your, to yourself, but to one another. You've given us brothers and sisters to walk through this life and be a refreshment to our souls, to one another. And so, Lord, we ask that may Faith Presbyterian continue to strive to be more so in the days ahead, both individually and collectively, a community that lives out this gospel love. And we ask that to your glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen.